Nietzsche, A History of Modern Philosophy, Book 19, authored by Will Durant. 1. In future, Nietzsche once wrote, Let no one concern himself about me, but only about the things for which I lived. We must make this biographical note brief. Nietzsche was born in Rucken, Germany, 1844, the son of a noble young parson. He was brought up in strict piety and prepared himself to enter the ministry. Even at boarding school, he was called the Little Minister and made people cry by his recitations from the Bible. We have pictures of him which show him in all his boyish seriousness. It is evident that he is of a deeply religious nature and therefore doomed to heresy. At eighteen, he discovers that he has begun to doubt the traditional creed. When I examine my own thoughts, he writes, and hearken into my own soul, I often feel as if I heard the buzzing and roaring of wild contending parties. At twenty-one, while studying in the University of Leipzig, he discovers the philosophy of Schopenhauer. He reads all hungrily, feeling here a kindred youth. The need of knowing myself, even of gnawing at myself, forcibly seized upon me. He is ripe for pessimism, having both religion and a bad stomach. Because of his defective eyesight, he is barred from military service. In 1870, he burns with patriotic fever and at last is allowed to join the army as a nurse but he is almost overcome at sight of the sick and wounded, and himself falls ill with dysentery and dyspepsia. In this same year, he sees a troop of cavalry pass through a town in stately gallop and array. His weakened frame thrills with the sight of this strength. I felt for the first time that the strongest and highest will to life does not find expression in a miserable struggle for existence, but in a will to war, a will to power, a will to overpower. Nevertheless, he settles down to a quietly ascetic life as professor of philology at the University of Basel. But there is adventure in him, and in his first book he slips from the prose of philology into an almost lyrical philosophy. Illness finds voice here in the eulogy of health, weakness in the deification of strength, melancholy in the praise of Dionysian joy, loneliness in the exaltation of friendship. He has a friend, Wagner, the once romantic rebel of revolution's barricades. But this friend too is taken from him, with slowly painful breaking of bond after bond. For Wagner, the strong, the overbearing, the ruthless, is coming to a philosophy of Christian sympathy and gentleness, qualities that cannot seem divine to Nietzsche, because they are long familiar elements in his own character. What I am not, he says most truthfully, that for me, is God and virtue. And so he stands at last alone, borne up solely by the exhilaration of creative thought. He has acquaintances, but he puts up with them simply like a patient animal. Not one has the faintest inkling of my task. And he suffers terribly through this absence of sympathy and understanding. He leaves even these acquaintances and abandons his work at Basel. Broken in health, he finds his way hopefully to the kindlier climate of Italy. Doctor after doctor prescribes for him, one prescription reading, a nice Italian sweetheart. He longs for the comradeship, but dreads the friction of marriage. It seems to me absurd, he writes, that one who has chosen for his sphere the assessment of existence as a whole should burden himself with the cares of a family, with winning bread, security, and social position for wife and children. He does not hesitate to conclude that, where the highest philosophical thinking is concerned, all married men are suspect. Nevertheless, he wanders humanly into something very like a love affair. He is almost shattered with rapid disillusionment and takes refuge in philosophy. Every misunderstanding, he tells himself, has made me freer. I want less and less from humanity and can give it more and more. The severance of every individual tie is hard to bear, but in each case a wing grows in its place. And yet the need of comradeship is still there, like a gnawing hunger. Many years later he catches a passing smile from a beautiful young woman whom he has never seen before, and suddenly my lonely philosopher's heart grew warm within me. 
but she walks off without seeing him, and they never meet again. The simple Italians who rent him his attic room in Genoa understand him better, perhaps, than he can be understood by more pretentious folk. They know his greatness, though they cannot classify it. The children of his landlady call him Il Santo, and the market women keep their choicest grapes for the bent philosopher who, it is whispered, writes bitterly about women and the superfluous. But what they know for certain is that he is a man of exceeding gentleness and purity, that he is the very soul of chivalry. Stories are still told of his politeness towards women, to whom no one else showed any kindness. Let him write what he pleases, so long as he is what he is. He lives simply, almost in poverty. His little room, writes a visitor, is bare and cheerless. It has evidently been selected for cheapness rather than for comfort. No carpet, not even a stove. I found it fearfully cold. His publisher has made no profit on his books. They are too sharply opposed to the spirit of the age, hence the title he gives to two of his volumes, Unzeitgemesse Betrachtungen, Thoughts Out of Season. There is no money, he is now informed, in such untimely volumes. Hereafter, he must publish his books at his own cost. He does, stinting himself severely to meet the new expense. His greatest books see the light in this way. He works hard, knowing that his shaken frame has but short lease of life, and he comes to love his painful solitude as a gift. I can't help seeing an enemy in anyone who breaks in upon my working summer. The idea that any person should intrude upon the web of thought which I am spinning around me is simply appalling. I have no more time to lose. Unless I am stingy with my precious half-hours, I shall have a bad conscience. Half-hours. His eyes will not work for more than thirty minutes at a time. He feels that only to him to whom time is holy does time bring reward. He is fully convinced, an acquaintance writes of him, about his mission and his permanent importance. In this belief, he is strong and great. It elevates him above all misfortune. He speaks of his Thus Spake Zarathustra in terms of almost conscious exaggeration. It is a book, he says, that stands alone. Do not let us mention the poets in the same breath. Nothing perhaps has ever been produced out of such a superabundance of strength. He does not know that it is his illness and his hunger for appreciation that have demanded this self-laudation as restorative and nourishment. He predicts, rightly enough, that he will not begin to get his due meed of appreciation till 1901. His unmasking of Christian morality, he says, is an event unequalled in history. All this man's energy is in his brain. He oozes ideas at every pore. He crowds into a sentence the material of a chapter, and every aphorism is a mountain peak. He dares to say that which others dare only to think, and we call him witty, because truth tabooed is the soul of wit. Every page bears the imprint of the passion and the pain that gave it birth. I am not a man, he says. I am dynamite. He writes like a man who feels error after error exploding at his touch, and he defines a philosopher as a terrible explosive in the presence of which everything is in danger. There are more idols than realities in the world, and I have an evil eye for idols. What is this philosophy which seemed to its creator more important than even the mightiest events of the past? How shall we compress it without distorting it as it has been distorted by so many of its lovers and its haters? Let us ask the man himself to speak to us. Let us see if we cannot put the matter in his own words, ourselves but supplying, so to speak, connective tissue. That done, we shall understand the man better and ourselves, and perhaps our social problem. 2. Exposition. Morality as impotence. From a biological standpoint, the phenomenon morality is of a highly suspicious nature. Qui bono. Whom shall we suspect of profiting by this institution? Is it a mode of enhancing life? Does it make men stronger and more perfect? Or does it make for deterioration and decay? It is obvious that up to the present, morality has not been a problem at all. 
It has rather been the very ground on which people have met, after all, distrust, dissension, and contradiction, the hallowed place of peace, where thinkers could obtain rest, even from themselves. But what if morality be the greatest of all the stumbling blocks in the way of human self-betterment? Is it possible that morality itself is the social problem, and that the solution of that problem lies in the judicious abolition of morality? It is a view for which something can be said. You have heard that morality is a means used by the strong to control the weak, and it is true. Just consider the conversion of Constantine. But to stop here is to let half the truth be passed off on you as the whole, and half a truth is half a lie. Much more true is it that morality is a means used by the weak to control the strong, the chain which weakness softly lays upon the feet of strength. The whole of the morality of Europe is based upon the values which are useful to the herd. Everyone's desire is that there should be no other teaching and valuation of things than those by means of which he himself succeeds. Thus, the fundamental tendency of the weak and mediocre of all times has been to enfeeble the strong and to reduce them to the level of the weak. Their chief weapon in this process was the moral principle. Good is everyone who does not oppress, who hurts no one, attacks no one, does not take vengeance but hands over vengeance to God, who goes out of the way of evil and demands little from life, like ourselves, patient, meek, just, Good is to do nothing for which we are not strong enough. Zarathustra laughed many times over the weaklings who thought themselves good because they had lame paws. Obedience, subordination, submission, devotion, love, the pride of duty, fatalism, resignation, objectivity, stoicism, asceticism, self-denial, in short, anemia. These are the virtues which the herd would have all men cultivate, particularly the strong men. And the deification of Jesus, that is to say of meekness, what was it but another attempt to lull the strong to sleep? Three, democracy. See now how nearly that attempt has succeeded. For is not democracy, if not victorious, at least on the road to victory today? And what is the democratic movement but the inheritor of Christianity? Not the Christianity of the great popes. They knew better and were building a splendid aristocracy when Luther spoiled it all by letting loose the leveling instincts of the herd. The instinct of the herd is in favor of the leveler, Christ. I very much fear that the first Christian is in his deepest instincts a rebel against everything privileged. He lives and struggles unremittingly for equal rights. It is by Christianity, more than by anything else, that the poison of this doctrine of equal rights has been spread abroad, and do not let us underestimate the fatal influence. Nowadays, no one has the courage of special rights, of rights of dominion. The aristocratic attitude of mind has been most thoroughly undermined by the lie of the equality of souls. But is not this the greatest of all lies, the equality of men? that is to say, the dominion of the inferior. Is it not the most threadbare and discredited of ideas? Democracy represents the disbelief in all great men and select classes. Everybody equals everybody else. At bottom, we are all heard. There is no welcome for the genius here. The more promising for the future the modern individual happens to be, the more suffering falls to his lot. If the rise of great and rare men had been made dependent upon the voices of the multitude, there never would have been any such thing as a great man. The herd regards the exception, whether it be above or beneath its general level, as something antagonistic and dangerous. Their trick in dealing with the exceptions above them, the strong, the mighty, the wise, the fruitful, is to persuade them to become their head servants. But the torture of the exceptional soul is only part of the villainy of democracies. The other part is chaos. Voltaire was right. Quand la populace se mêle de raisonner, tout est perdu. Democracy is an aristocracy of orators, a competition in headlines, a maelstrom of ever-new majorities, a torrent of petty factions sweeping on to ruin. 
Under democracy, the state will decay, for the instability of legislation will leave little respect for law, until finally, even the policeman will have to be replaced by private enterprise. Democracy has always been the death agony of the power of organization. Remember Athens and look at England. Within 50 years, these Babel governments will clash in a gigantic war for the control of the markets of the world. And when that war comes, England will pay the penalty for the democratic inefficiency of its dominant muddle class. This wave of democracy will recede and recede quickly if men of ability will only oppose it openly. It is necessary for higher men to declare war on the masses. In all directions, mediocre people are joining hands in order to make themselves master. The middle classes must be dissolved and their influence decreased. There must be no more intermarrying of aristocracy with plutocracy. This democratic folly would never have come at all had not the master classes allowed their blood to be mingled with that of slaves. Let us fight parliamentary government and the power of the press. They are the means whereby cattle become rulers. Finally, it is senseless and dangerous to let the counting mania, the custom of universal suffrage, which is still but a short time under cultivation and could easily be uprooted, take deeper root. Its introduction was merely an expedient to steer clear of temporary difficulties. The time is ripe for a demonstration of democratic incompetence and a restoration of power to men who are born to rule. 4. Feminism. Democracy, after all, is a disease, an attempt on the part of the botch to lay down for all the laws of social health. You may observe the disease in its growth process by studying the woman movement. Woman's first and last function is that of bearing robust children. The emancipated ones are the abortions among women, those who lack the wherewithal to have children. I go no farther, lest I should become medicinical. All intellect in women is a pretension. When a woman has scholarly inclinations, there is generally something wrong with her sex. These women think to make themselves charming to free spirits by wearing advanced views, as though a woman without piety would not be something perfectly obnoxious and ludicrous to a profound and godless man. If there is anything worthy of laughter, it is the man who takes part in this feminist agitation. Let it be understood clearly that the relations between men and women make equality impossible. It is in the nature of woman to take colour and commandment from a man, unless she happens to be a man. Man's happiness is, I will. Woman's happiness is, he will. Woman gives herself, man takes her. I do not think one will get over this natural contrast by any social contract. Indeed, women will lose power with every step towards emancipation. Since the French Revolution, the influence of woman has declined in proportion as she has increased her rights and claims. Let her first do her proper work properly, consider how much man has suffered from stupidity in the kitchen, and then it may be time to consider an extension of her activities. To be mistaken in this fundamental problem of man and woman to deny here the profoundest antagonism and the necessity for an eternally hostile tension, to dream here of equal rights, equal training, equal claims and obligations, that is a typical sign of shallow-mindedness. On the other hand, a man who has depth of spirit as well as of desires, and has also the depth of benevolence which is capable of severity and harshness, and easily confounded with them, can only think of woman as Orientals do. He must conceive of her as a possession, as confinable property, as a being predestined for service and accomplishing her mission therein. He must take his stand in this matter upon the immense rationality of Asia, upon the superiority of the instincts of Asia. 5. Socialism and Anarchism all this uprising of housekeepers is, of course, part of the general sickness with which Christianity has inoculated and weakened the strong races of Europe. Consider now the more virulent forms of the disease, socialism and anarchism. The coming of the kingdom of God has here been placed in the future and been given an earthly, a human meaning. But on the whole, the faith in the old ideal is still maintained. 
there is still the comforting delusion about equal rights with all the envy that lurks in that delusion. One speaks of equal rights. That is to say, so long as one is not a dominant personality, one wishes to prevent one's competitors from growing in power. It is a pleasure for all poor devils to grumble. It gives them a little intoxicating sensation of power. There is a small dose of revenge in every lamentation. When you hear one of those reformers talk of humanity, you must not take him seriously. It is only his way of getting fools to believe that he is an altruist. Beneath the cover of this bunkum, a man strong in the gregarious instincts makes his bid for fame and followers and power. This pretense to altruism is only a roundabout way of asking for altruism. It is the result of a consciousness of the fact that one is botched and bungled. In short, socialism is not justice, but covetousness. No doubt we should look upon its exponents and followers with ironic compassion. They want something which we have. From the standpoint of natural science, the highest conception of society, according to socialists, is the lowest in the order of rank among societies. A socialist community would be another China, a vast and stifling mediocrity. It would be the tyranny of the lowest and most brainless brought to its zenith. A nation in which there would be no exploitation would be dead. Life itself is essentially appropriation, conquest of the strange and weak, to put it at its mildest, exploitation. The absence of exploitation would mean the end of organic functioning. Surely it is as legitimate and valuable for superior men to command and use inferior men as it is for superior species to command and use inferior species, as man commands and uses animals. It is not surprising that the lamb should bear a grudge against the great birds of prey, but that is no reason for blaming the great birds of prey. What should be done with muscle except to supply it with directive brains? How otherwise can anything worthy ever be built by men? In fact, man has value and significance only in so far as he is a stone in a great building, for which purpose he has first of all to be solid. He has to be a stone. Now, the common people understand this quite well and are as happy as any of the well-to-do, so long as a silly propaganda does not disturb them with dreams that can never be fulfilled. Poverty, cheerfulness, and independence. It is possible to find these three qualities combined in one individual. Poverty, cheerfulness, and slavery. This is likewise a possible combination and I can say nothing better to the workmen who serve as factory slaves. As for the upper classes, they need be at no loss for weapons with which to fight this pestilence. An occasional opening of the trapdoor between the haves and the have-nots, increasing the number of property owners, will serve best of all. If this policy is pursued, there will always be too many people of property for socialism ever to signify anything more than an attack of illness. A little patience with inheritance and income taxes, and the noise of the cattle will subside. Notice, meanwhile, that socialism and despotism are bedfellows. Give the socialist his way, and he will put everything into the hands of the state, that is to say, into the hands of demagogue politicians. And then, all in the twinkling of an eye, socialism begets its opposite in good Hegelian fashion, and the dogs of anarchism are let loose to fill the world with their howling and not without excuse or benefit, for politicians must be kept in their place and the state rigidly restricted to its necessary functions, even if anarchist agitation helps one to do it. And the anarchists are right. The state is the coldest of all monsters, and this lie creeps out of its mouth. I, the state, am the people. So the wise man will turn anarchism as well as socialism to account, and he will not fret even when a king or two is hurried into heaven with nitroglycerin. Only since they have been shot at have princes once more sat securely on their thrones. Anarchism justifies itself in the aristocrat, who feels law as his instrument, not as his master. But the rebellion against law as such is but one more outburst of physiological misfits bent on levelling and revenge. It is childish to desire a society in which every individual would have as much freedom as another.
Decadence speaks in the democratic idiosyncrasy against everything which rules and wishes to rule, the modern misarchism, to coin a bad word for a bad thing. When all men are strong enough to command, then law will be superfluous. Weakness needs the vertebrae of law. He is commanded who cannot obey his own self. Let the anarchist be thankful that he has laws to obey. To command is more difficult. Whenever living things command, they risk themselves. They take the hard responsibilities for the result. Freedom is the will to be responsible for ourselves. When the mob is capable of that, it will be time to think of dispensing with law. The truth is, of course, that the anarchist is lulled into nonsense by Rousseau's notion of the naturally good man. He does not understand that revolution merely unlashes the dogs in man till they once more cry for the whip. Cast out the Bourbons, and in ten years you will welcome Napoleon. That is the end of anarchism, and it is the end of democracy too. The truth is that men are willing and anxious to be ruled by rulers worthy of the name. But the corrupted ruling classes have brought ruling into evil odour. The degeneration of the ruler and of the ruling classes has been the cause of all the disorders in history. Democracy is not ruling, but drifting. It is a political relaxation, as if an organism were to allow each of its parts to do just as it pleased. Precisely these disorganizing principles give our age its specific character. Our society has lost the power to function properly. It no longer rids itself naturally of its rotten elements. It no longer has the strength even to excrete. 6. Degeneration. What kind of men is to be found in such a society? Mediocre men, men stupid to the point of sanctity. Fragile, useless souls deluxe, men suffering from a sort of hemiplegia of virtue, that is to say, paralysed in the self-assertive instincts, men tamed, almost emasculated by a morality whose essence is the abdication of the will. Now, as a rule, the taming of a beast is achieved only by deteriorating it. So too, the moral man is not a better man. He is rather a weaker member of his species. He is altruistic, of course. That is, he feels that he needs help. There is no place for really great men in this march towards non-entity. If a great man appears, he is called a criminal. A Periclean Greek, a Renaissance Florentine, would breathe like one asphyxiated in this moralic acid atmosphere. The first condition of life for such a man is that he free himself from this China Dome of the spirit. But the number of those who are capable of rising into the pure air of unmoralism is very small, and those who have made timid sallies into theological heresy are the most addicted to the comfort and security of ethical orthodoxy. In short, men are coming to look upon lowered vitality as the heart of virtue, and morality will be saddled with the guilt if the maximum potentiality of the power and splendor of the human species should never be attained. Men of this stamp require a good deal of religious pepsin to overcome the indigestibility of life. If they leave one faith in the passing bravery of their youth, they soon sink back into another. God, previously diluted from tribal deity into substantia and dingensich, now recovers a respectable degree of reality. The imaginary pillar on which men lean is made stronger and more concrete as their weakness increases. How much faith a person requires in order to flourish, how much fixed opinion he needs, which he does not wish to have shaken, because he holds himself thereby, is a measure of his power, or more plainly speaking, of his weakness. The same criterion classifies our friends the metaphysicians, those albinos of thought, who are, of course, priests in disguise. The degree of a man's willpower may be measured by the extent to which he can dispense with the meaning in things, by the extent to which he is able to endure a world without meaning, because he himself arranges a small portion of it. The world has no meaning. All the better. Put some meaning into it, says the man with a man's heart. The world has no meaning, but it is only a world of appearance, says the weak-kneed philosopher. Behind this phenomenal world, is the real world which has meaning and means good. Of the real world, there is no knowledge, 
Consequently, there is a God. What novel elegance of syllogism. This belief that the world which ought to be is real is a belief proper to the unfruitful who do not wish to create a world. The will to truth is the impotence of the will to create. Even monism is being turned into medicine for sick souls. Clearly, these lovers of wisdom seek not truth, but remedies for their illnesses. There is too much beer and midnight oil in modern philosophy, and not enough fresh air. Philosophers condemn this world because they have avoided it. Those who are contemplative naturally belittle activity. In truth, the history of philosophy is the story of a secret and mad hatred of the prerequisites of life, of the feelings which make for the real values of life. No wonder that philosophy is fallen to such low estate. Science flourishes nowadays and has the good conscience clearly visible on its countenance. While the remnant to which modern philosophy has gradually sunk excites distrust and displeasure, if not scorn and pity. Philosophy reduced to a theory of knowledge, a philosophy that never gets beyond the threshold and rigorously denies itself the right to enter, that is philosophy in its last throes, an end, an agony, something that awakens pity. How could such a philosophy rule? 7. Nihilism all these things, democracy, feminism, socialism, anarchism, and modern philosophy, are heads of the Christian hydra, each a sore in the total disease. Given such illness, affecting all parts of the social body, and what results shall we expect and find? Pessimism, despair, nihilism, that is, disbelief in all values of life. Confidence in life is gone. Life itself has become a problem. Love of life is still possible, only it is the love of a woman of whom one is doubtful. The good man, sees himself surrounded by evil, discovers traces of evil in every one of his acts, and thus he ultimately arrives at the conclusion, which to him is quite logical, that nature is evil, that man is corrupted, and that being good is an act of grace, that is to say, it is impossible to man when he stands alone. In short, he denies life. The man who frees himself from the theology of the church but adheres to Christian ethics necessarily falls into pessimism. He perceives that man is no longer an assistant in, let alone the culmination of, the evolutionary process. He perceives that becoming has been aiming at nothing and has achieved it, and that is something which he cannot bear. Suffering, which was before a trial with promised reward, is now an intolerable mystery. If he is materially comfortable himself, he finds source for sentiment and tears in the pain and misery of others. He concocts a social problem, and never dreams that the social problem is itself a result of decadence. He does not feel at home in this world in which the Christian God is dead, and to which, nevertheless, he brings nothing more appreciative than the old Christian moral attitude. He despairs because he is a chaos and knows it. I do not know where I am or what I am to do. I am everything that knows not where it is or what to do, he sighs. Life, he says at last, is not worth living. Let us not try to answer such a man. He needs not logic, but a sanitarium. But see, through him and in him, the destructiveness of Christian morals. This despicable civilization, says Rousseau, is to blame for our bad morality. What if our good morality is to blame for this despicable civilization? See how the old ethic depreciates the joy of living and the gratitude felt towards life, how it checks the knowledge and unfolding of life, how it chokes the impulse to beautify and ennoble life. And at what a time! Think what a race with masculine will could accomplish now. Precisely now, when will in its fullest strength were necessary, it is in the weakest and most pusillanimous condition. Absolute mistrust concerning the organizing power of the will, to that we have come. The world is dark with despair at the moment of greatest light. What if man could be made to love the light and use it? 8. The Will to Power is it possible that this despair is not the final state in the exhaustion of a race, 
but only a transition from belief in a perfect and ethical world to an attitude of transvaluation and control. Perhaps we are at the bottom of our spiritual toboggan, and an ascending movement is around the corner of the years. Now that our Christian bubble has burst into Schopenhauer, we are left free to recover some part of the joyous strength of the ancients. Let us become again as little children, unspoiled by religion and morality. Let us forget what it is to feel sinful. Let the thousand-fold laughter of children clear the air of the odour of decay. Let us begin anew, and the soul will rise and overflow all its margins with the joy of rediscovered life. Life has not deceived us. On the contrary, from year to year it appears richer, more desirable, and more mysterious. The old fetters are broken by the thought that life may be an experiment and not a duty, not a fatality, not a deceit. Life, that means for us to transform constantly into light and flame all that we are and also all that we meet with. We cannot possibly do otherwise. To be natural again, to dare to be as immoral as nature is, to be such pagans as were the Greeks of the Homeric age, to say yea to life, even to its suffering, to win back some of that mountain air Dionysian spirit which took pleasure in the tragic, nay, which invented tragedy as the expression of its superabundant vitality, as the expression of its welcome of even the cruelest and most terrible elements of life, to be healthy once more. For there is no other virtue than health, vigour, energy. All virtues should be looked upon as physiological conditions and moral judgments are symptoms of physiological prosperity or the reverse. Indeed, it might be worthwhile to try to see whether a scientific order of values might not be constructed according to a scale of numbers and measures representing energy. All other values are matters of prejudice, simplicity and misunderstanding. Instead of moral values, let us use naturalistic values, physiological values. Let us say frankly with Spinoza that virtue and power are one and the same. What is good? All that enhances the feeling of power, the will to power and power itself in man. What is bad? All that proceeds from weakness. What is happiness? The feeling that power is increasing, that resistance is being overcome. This is not orthodox ethics, and perhaps it will not do for long years, though an unspoiled youth would understand it. A healthy and vigorous boy will look up sarcastically if you ask him, do you wish to become virtuous? But ask him, do you wish to become stronger than your comrades? And he is all eagerness at once. Youth knows that ability is virtue. Watch the athletic field. Youth is not at home in the classroom because their knowledge is estranged from action and youth measures the height of what a man knows by the depth of his power to do. There is a better gospel in the boy on the field than in the man in the pulpit. Which of the boys whom we know do we love best in our secret hearts, the prayerful Aloysius or the masterful leader of the urchins in the street? We moralize and sermonize in mean efforts to bring the young tyrant down to our virtuous anemia. But we know that we are wrong, and respect him most when he stands his ground most firmly. To require of strength that it should express itself as weakness is just as absurd as to require of weakness that it should express itself as strength. Let us go to school to our children, and we shall understand that all native propensities are beneficent, that the evil impulses are to a far view as necessary and preservative as the good. In truth, we worship youth, because at its finest it is a free discharge of instinctive strength, and we know that happiness is nothing else than that. To abandon instinct, to deliberate, to clog action with conscious thought, that is to achieve old age. After all, nothing can be done perfectly so long as it is done consciously. Consciousness is a defect to be overcome. Instinct is the most intelligent of all kinds of intelligence which have hitherto been discovered. Genius lies in the instincts. Goodness, too. All consciousness is theatricality. When a people begins to worship reason, it begins to die. Youth knows better. It follows instinct trustfully 
and worships power. And we worship power too, and should say so were we as honest as our children. Our gentlest virtues are but forms of power. Out of the abundance of the power of sex come kindness and pity, out of revenge, justice, out of the love of resistance, bravery. Love is a secret path to the heart of the powerful in order to become his master. Gratitude is revenge of a lofty kind. Self-sacrifice is an attempt to share in the power of him to whom the sacrifice is made. Honour is the acknowledgement of an equal power. Praise is the pride of the judge. All conferring of benefits is an exercise of power. Behold a man in distress. Straightway the compassionate ones come to him, depict his misfortune to him, at last go away, satisfied and elevated. They have gloated over the unhappy man's misfortune and their own. They have spent a pleasant Sunday afternoon. So with the scientist and the philosopher, in their thirst for knowledge lurks the lust of gain and conquest, and the cry of the oppressed for freedom is again a cry for power. You cannot understand man, you cannot understand society, until you learn to see in all things this will to power. Physiologists should bethink themselves before putting down the instinct of self-preservation as the cardinal instinct of an organic being. A living thing seeks above all to discharge its strength. Self-preservation is only one of the results of this, and psychologists should think twice before saying that happiness or pleasure is the motive of all action. Pleasure is but an incident of the restless search for power. Happiness is an accompanying not an actuating factor. The feeling of happiness lies precisely in the discontentedness of the will, in the fact that without opponents and obstacles it is never satisfied. Man is now master of the forces of nature, and master too of his own wild and unbridled feelings. In comparison with primitive man, the man of today represents an enormous quantum of power, but not an increase of happiness. How can one maintain, then, that man has striven after happiness? No, not happiness, but more power. Not peace at any price, but war. Not virtue, but capacity. That is the secret of man's longing and man's seeking. Let biologists, too, re-examine the stock-in-trade of their theory. Life is not the continuous adjustment of internal to external relations, but will to power, which, proceeding from within, subjugates and incorporates an ever-increasing quantity of external phenomena. All motive force, all causation, whatever, is this will to power. There is no other force, physical, dynamical or psychical. As to the famous struggle for existence, it seems at present to be more of an assumption than a fact. It does occur, but as an exception and it is due not to a desire for food, but a turgo to a surcharge of energy demanding discharge. The general condition of life is not one of want or famine, but rather of riches, of lavish luxuriance, and even of absurd prodigality. Where there is a struggle, it is a struggle for power. We must not confound Malthus with nature. One does indeed find the cruelty of nature which is so often referred to, but in a different place. Nature is cruel, but against her lucky and well-constituted children, she protects and shelters and loves the lowly. Darwin sees selection in favour of the stronger, the better constituted. Precisely the reverse stares one in the face. The suppression of the lucky cases, the reversion to average, the uselessness of the more highly constituted types, the inevitable mastery of the mediocre, if we drew our morals from reality, they would read thus, the mediocre are more valuable than the exceptional creatures. The will to non-entity prevails over the will to life. We have to beware of this formulation of reality into a moral. No, morality is not mediocrity, it is superiority. It does not mean being like most people, but being better, stronger, more capable than most people. It does not mean timidity. If anything is virtue, it is to stand unafraid in the presence of any prohibition. It does not mean the pursuit of ends sanctified by society. It means the will to your own ends, 
and to the means to them. It means behaving as states behave, with frank abandonment of all altruistic pretense. Corporate bodies are intended to do that which individuals have not the courage to do. For this reason, all communities are vastly more upright and instructive as regards the nature of man than individuals who are too cowardly to have the courage of their desires. All altruism is the prudence of the private man. Societies are not mutually altruistic. Altruism and life are incompatible. All the forces and instincts which are the source of life lie stagnant beneath the ban of the old morality. But real morality is certainty of instinct, effectiveness of action. It is any action which increases the power of a man or of men. It is an expression of ascendant and expanding life. It is achievement. It is power. 9. The Superman With such a morality, you breed men who are men. And to breed men who are men is all that your social problem comes to. This does not mean that the whole race is to be improved. The very last thing a sensible man would promise to accomplish would be to improve mankind. Mankind does not improve, it does not even exist. The aspect of the whole is much more like that of a huge experimenting workshop, where some things in all ages succeed, while an incalculable number of things fail. To say that the social problem consists in a general raising of the average standard of comfort and ability amounts to abandoning the problem. There is as little prospect of mankind's attaining to a higher order as there is for the ant and the earwig to enter into kinship with God and eternity. The most fundamental of all errors here lies in regarding the many, the herd, as an aim instead of the individual. The herd is only a means. The road to perfection lies in the bringing forth of the most powerful individuals, for whose use the great masses would be converted into mere tools, into the most intelligent and flexible tools possible. Every human being, with his total activity, has dignity and significance only so far as he is, consciously or unconsciously, a tool in the service of a superior individual. All that can be done is to produce here and there, now and then, such a superior individual, l'uomo singulare, the higher man, the superman. The problem does not concern what humanity as a whole or as a species is to accomplish, but what kind of man is to be desired as highest in value, what kind of man is to be worked for and bred. To produce the superman, that is the social problem. If this is not understood, nothing is understood. Now what would such a man be like? Shall we try to picture him? We see him as above all a lover of life, strong enough too to love life without deceiving himself about it. There is no memento mori here, rather a memento viva. Rich instincts call for much living, a hard man loving danger and difficulty. What does not kill him, he feels, leaves him stronger. Pleasure, pleasure as it is understood by the rich, is repugnant to him. He seeks not pleasure, but work, not happiness, but responsibility and achievement. He does not make philosophy an excuse for living prudently and apart, an artifice for withdrawing successfully from the game of life. He does not stand aside and merely look on. He puts his shoulder to the wheel. For him, it is the essence of philosophy to feel the obligation and burden of a hundred attempts and temptations, the joy of a hundred adventures. He risks himself constantly. He plays out to the end this bad game. To risk and to create, this is the meaning of life to the superman. He could not bear to be a man if man could not be a poet, a maker. To change every it was into a thus I would have it. In this he finds that life may redeem itself. He is moved not by ambition, but by a mighty, overflowing, spendthrift spirit that drives him on. He must remake. For this, he compels all things to come to him and into him in order that they may flow back from him as gifts of his love and his abundance. In this refashioning of things by thought, he sees the holiness of life. The greatest events, he knows, are these still creative hours. He is a man of contrasts or contradictions. He does not desire to be always the same man. 
He is a multitude of elements and of men. His value lies precisely in his comprehensiveness and multifariousness, in the variety of burdens which he can bear, in the extent to which he can stretch his responsibility. In him, the antagonistic character of existence is represented and justified. He loves instinct, knows that it is the fountain of all his energies. But he knows, too, the natural delight of aesthetic natures in measure, the pleasure of self-restraint, the exhilaration of the rider on a fiery steed. He is a selective principle. He rejects much. He reacts slowly to all kinds of stimuli with that tardiness which long caution and deliberate pride have bred in him. He tests the approaching stimulus. He decides slowly, but he holds firmly to a decision made. He loves and has the qualities which the folk call virtues, but he loves too and shows the qualities which the folk call vices. It is again in this union of opposites that he rises above mediocrity. He is a broad arch that spans two banks lying far apart. The folk on either side fear him, for they cannot calculate on him or classify him. He is a free spirit, an enemy of all fetters and labels. He belongs to no party, knowing that the man who belongs to a party perforce becomes a liar. He is a skeptic, not that he must appear to be one. Freedom from any kind of conviction is a necessary factor in his strength of will. He does not make propaganda or proselytes. He keeps his ideals to himself as distinctions. His opinion is his opinion. Another person has not easily a right to it. He has renounced the bad taste of wishing to agree with many people. He knows that he cannot reveal himself to anybody. Like everything profound, he loves the mask. He does not descend to familiarity and is not familiar when people think he is. If he cannot lead, he walks alone. He has not only intellect, if that were all it would not be enough, he has blood. Behind him is a lineage of culture and ability, lives of danger and distinction. His ancestors have paid the price for what he is, just as most men pay the price for what their ancestors have been. Naturally, then, he has a strong feeling of distance. He sees inequality and gradation, order and rank everywhere among men. He has the most aristocratic of virtues, intellectual honesty. He does not readily become a friend or an enemy. He honours only his equals and therefore cannot be the enemy of many. Where one despises, one cannot wage war. He lacks the power of easy reconciliation, but retaliation is as incomprehensible to him as equal rights. He remains just even as regards his injurer. Despite the strong provocation of personal insult, the clear and lofty objectivity of the just and judging eye, whose glance is as profound as it is gentle, is untroubled. He recognises duties only to his equals. To others he does what he thinks best. He knows that justice is found only among equals. He has that distinctively aristocratic trait, the ability to command and with equal readiness to obey, that is indispensable to his pride. He will not permit himself to be praised. He does what serves his purpose. The essence of him is that he has a purpose, for which he will not hesitate to run all risks, even to sacrifice men, to bend their backs to the worst. That something may exist which is a hundred times more important than the question whether he feels well or unwell, and therefore to whether the others feel well or unwell. This is a fundamental instinct of his nature. To have a purpose and to cleave to it through all dangers till it be achieved, that is his great passion, that is himself. 10. How to make supermen. It is our task then to procreate this synthetic man who embodies everything and justifies it, and for whom the rest of mankind is but soil, to bring the philosopher, the artist, and the saint within and without us to the light, and to strive thereby for the completion of nature. In this cultivation lies the meaning of culture, the direction of all life to the end of producing the finest possible individuals. What is great in man is that he is a bridge and not a goal. His very essence is to create a being higher than himself. That is the instinct of procreation, the instinct of action and of work. 
Even the higher man himself feels this need of begetting, and for lesser men all virtue and morals lie in preparing the way that the superman may come. There is no greater horror than the degenerating soul which says, all for myself. In this great purpose, too, is the essence of a better religion and a surpassing of the bounds of narrow individualism. With this purpose there come moments, sparks from the clear fire of love, in whose light we understand the word I no longer. We feel that we are creating, and therefore, in a sense, becoming something greater than ourselves. How to make straight the way for the superman? First, by reforming marriage. Let it be understood at once that love is a hindrance rather than a help to such marriages as are calculated to breed higher men. To regard a thing as beautiful is necessarily to regard it falsely. That is why love marriages are from the social point of view the most unreasonable form of matrimony. Were there a benevolent God, the marriages of men would cause him more displeasure than anything else. He would observe that all buyers are careful, but that even the most cunning one buys his wife in a sack, and surely he would cause the earth to tremble in convulsions when a saint and a goose couple. When a man is in love, he should not be allowed to come to a decision about his life, and to determine once for all the character of his lifelong society on account of a whim. If we treated marriage seriously, we would publicly declare invalid the vows of lovers and refuse them permission to marry. We would remake public opinion so that it would encourage trial marriage. We would exact certificates of health and good ancestry. We would punish bachelorhood by longer military service and would reward with all sorts of privileges those fathers who should lavish sons upon the world. And above all, we would make people understand that the purpose of marriage is not that they should duplicate, but that they should surpass themselves. Perhaps we would read to them from Zarathustra with fitting ceremonies and solemnities. Thou art young and wishest for child and marriage. But I ask thee, art thou a man who dareth to wish for a child? Art thou the victorious one, the self-subduer, the commander of thy senses, the master of thy virtues? Or in thy wish doth there speak the animal, or necessity, or solitude, or discord with thyself? I would that thy victory and freedom were longing for a child. Thou shalt build living monuments unto thy victory and thy liberation. Thou shalt build beyond thyself. But first thou must build thyself square in body and soul. Thou shalt not only propagate thyself, but propagate thyself upward. Marriage. Thus I call the will of two to create that one which is more than they who created it. I call marriage reverence unto each other as unto those who will such a will. In a word, eugenic marriage, and after eugenic marriage, rigorous education. But interest in education will become powerful only when belief in a God and his care have been abandoned, just as medicine began to flourish only when the belief in miraculous cures had lapsed. When men begin at last to believe in education, they will endure much rather than have their sons miss going to a good and hard school at the proper time. What is it that one learns in a hard school? To obey and to command. For this is what distinguishes hard schooling as good schooling from every other schooling, namely that a good deal is demanded, severely exacted, that excellence is required as if it were normal, that praise is scanty, that leniency is non-existent, that blame is sharp, practical, and without reprieve, and has no regard to talent and antecedents, to prefer danger to comfort, not to weigh in a tradesman's balance what is permitted and what is forbidden, to be more hostile to pettiness, slyness, and parasitism than to wickedness. We are in every need of a school where these things would be taught. Such a school would allow its pupils to learn productively by living and doing. It would not subject them to the tyranny of books and the weight of the past. It would teach them less about the past and more about the future. It would teach them the future of humanity as depending on human will, on their will. It would prepare the way for and be a part of a vast enterprise in breeding and education. But even such a school would not provide all that is necessary in education. 
Not all should receive the same training and the same care. Select groups must be chosen and special instruction lavished on them. The greatest success, however, will remain for the man who does not seek to educate either everybody or certain limited circles, but only one single individual. The last century was superior to ours precisely because it possessed so many individually educated men. 11. On the necessity of exploitation, and next, slavery. This is one of those ugly words which are the verba non grata of modern discussion because they jar us so ruthlessly out of the grooves of our thinking. Nevertheless, it is clear to all but those to whom self-deception is the staff of life that as the honest Greeks had it, some are born to be slaves. Try to educate all men equally, and you become the laughing stock of your own maturity. The masses seem to be worth notice in three aspects only. First, as the copies of great men, printed on bad paper from worn-out plates. Next, as a contrast to the great men, and lastly, as their tools. Living consists in living at the cost of others. The man who has not grasped this fact has not taken the first step towards truth to himself, and to consider distress of all kinds as an objection, as something which must be done away with, is the greatest nonsense on earth, almost as mad as the will to abolish bad weather out of pity to the poor, so to speak. The masses must be used, whether that means or does not mean that they must suffer. It requires great strength to live and forget how far life and injustice are won. What is the suffering of whole peoples compared to the creative agonies of great individuals? There are many who threw away everything they were worth when they threw away their slavery. In all respects, slaves live more securely and more happily than modern labourers. The labourer chooses his harder lot to satisfy the vanity of telling himself that he is not a slave. These men are dangerous, not because they are strong, but because they are sick. It is the sick who are the greatest danger to the healthy. It is the weak ones, they who mouth so much about their sickness, who vomit bile and call it newspaper. It is they who instil the most dangerous venom and scepticism into our trust in life, in man and in ourselves. It is they who most undermine the life beneath our feet. It is for such as these that Christianity may serve a good purpose, so serving our purpose too. Those qualities which are within the grasp only of the strongest and most terrible natures, and which make their existence possible, leisure, adventure, disbelief, and even dissipation, would necessarily ruin mediocre natures, and does do so when they possess them. In the case of the latter, industry, regularity, moderation, and strong conviction are in their proper place, in short, all gregarious virtues. Under their influence, these mediocre men become perfect. We good Europeans, then, though atheists and immoralists, will take care to support the religions and the morality which are associated with the gregarious instinct. For by means of them, an order of men is, so to speak, prepared, which must at some time or other fall into our hands, which must actually crave for our hands. Slavery, let us understand it well, is the necessary price of culture. The free work, or art, of some involves the compulsory labour of others. As in the organism, so in society, the higher function is possible only through the subjection of the lower functions. A high civilization is a pyramid. It can stand only on a broad base. Its first prerequisite is a strongly and soundly consolidated mediocrity. In order that there may be a broad, deep and fruitful soil for the development of art, the enormous majority must, in the service of a minority, be slavishly subjected. At their cost, through the surplus of their labour, that privileged class is to be relieved from the struggle for existence in order to create and to satisfy a new world of want. The misery of the toilers must still increase in order to make the production of a world of art possible to a small number of Olympian men. 12. Aristocracy The greatest folly of the strong is to let the weak make them ashamed to exploit, to let the weak suggest to them, it is a shame to be happy. There is too much misery. 
Let us therefore reaffirm the right of the happy to existence, the right of bells with a full tone over bells that are cracked and discordant. Not that exploitation as such is desirable. It is good only where it supports and develops an aristocracy of higher men who are themselves developing still higher men. This philosophy aims not at an individualistic morality, but at a new order of rank. In this age of universal suffrage, in this age in which everybody is allowed to sit in judgment upon everything and everybody, one feels compelled to re-establish the order of rank. The higher men must be protected from contamination and suffocation by the lower. The richest and most complex forms perish so easily. Only the lowest succeed in maintaining their apparent imperishableness. The first question as to the order of rank, how far is a man disposed to be solitary or gregarious? If he is disposed to be gregarious, his value consists in those qualities which secure the survival of his tribe or type. If he is disposed to be solitary, his qualities are those which distinguish him from others. Hence, the important consequence. The solitary type should not be valued from the standpoint of the gregarious type, or vice versa. Viewed from above, both types are necessary, and so is their antagonism. Degeneration lies in the approximation of the qualities of the herd to those of the solitary creature, and vice versa. In short, in their beginning to resemble each other. Hence the difference in their virtues, their rights, and their obligations. In the light of this difference, one comes to abhor the vulgarity of Stuart Mill when he says, What is right for one man is right for another. It is not. What is right for the herd is precisely what is wrong for their leaders, and what is right for the leaders is wrong for the herd. The leaders use, the herd is used. The virtues of either lie in the efficiency here of leadership, there of service. Slave morality is one thing, and master morality another. And leadership, of course, requires an aristocracy. Let us repeat it. Democracy has always been the death agony of the power of organization and direction. These require great aristocratic families, with long traditions of administration and leadership. Old ancestral lines that guarantee for many generations the duration of the necessary will and the necessary instincts. Not only aristocracy then, but caste. For if a man have plebeian ancestors, his soul will be a plebeian soul. Education, discipline, culture will be wasted on him, merely enabling him to become a great liar. Therefore, intermarriage, even social intercourse of leaders with herd, is to be avoided with all precaution and intolerance. Too much intercourse with barbarians ruin the Romans and will ruin any noble race. In what direction may one turn with any hope of finding even the aspiration for such an aristocracy? Only there where a noble attitude of mind prevails, an attitude of mind which believes in slavery and in manifold orders of rank as the prerequisites of any higher degree of culture. Men with this attitude of mind will insistently call for and will at last produce philosophical men of power, artist tyrants, a higher kind of men, which thanks to their preponderance of will, knowledge, riches and influence, will avail themselves of democratic Europe as the most suitable and subtle instrument for taking the fate of Europe into their hands and working as artists upon man himself. The fundamental belief of these great desirers will be that society must not be allowed to exist for its own sake, but only as the foundation and scaffolding by means of which a select class of beings may be able to elevate themselves to their highest duties and in general to a higher existence. Like those sun-climbing plants in Java which encircle an oak so long and so often with their arms that at last, high above it but supported by it, they can unfold their tops in the open light and exhibit their happiness. 13. Signs of Ascent are we moving towards such a consummation? Can we detect about us any signs of this ascending movement of life? Not signs of progress? That is another narcotic like Christianity, good for slaves, but to be avoided by those who rule. Man as a species is not progressing. The general level of the species is not raised. But humanity as mass sacrificed to the prosperity of the one stronger type of man, 
that would be a progress. Progress of this kind, to some degree, there has always been. The ruling class in Greece, as seen in Homer and even in Thucydides, though with Socrates degeneration begins, is an example of this kind of progress or attainment. Imagine that this culture, which has its poet in Sophocles, its statesman in Pericles, its physician in Hippocrates, its natural philosopher in Democritus, here is a yea saying, a gratitude to life in all its manifestations. Here, life is understood and covered with art that it may be born. Here, men are frivolous so that they may forget for a moment the arduousness and perilousness of their task. They are superficial but from profundity. They exalt philosophers who preach moderation because they themselves are so immoderate, so instinctive, so hilariously wild. They are great, they are elevated above any ruling class before or after them, because here the morals of the governing caste have grown up among the governing caste and not among the herd. We catch some of the glory of these Greeks in the men of the Renaissance, men perfect in their immorality, terrible in their demands. We should not dare to stand amid the conditions which produced these men and which these men produced. We should not even dare to imagine ourselves in those conditions. Our nerves would not endure that reality, not to speak of our muscles. One man of their type, continuator and development of their type, brother, as Taine most rightly says, of Dante and Michelangelo. One such man we have known with less of the protection of distance, and he was too hard to bear. That E.N.'s realissimum, synthesis of monster and superman, surnamed Napoleon. The first man, and the man of greatest initiative and developed views of modern times, a man of tolerance, not out of weakness, but out of strength, able to risk the full enjoyment of naturalness and be strong enough for this freedom. In such a man we see something in the nature of disinterestedness. In his work on his marble, whatever be the number of men that are sacrificed in the process, men were glad to serve him as most normal men are glad to serve the great man. The crowd was tired of equal rights, tired of being masterless. It longed to worship genius again. What was the excuse for that terrible farce, the French Revolution? It made men ready for Napoleon. When shall we produce another superman? Let us go back to our question. Can we detect about us any signs of strength? Yes. We are learning to get along without God. We are recovering from the noble sentiments of Rousseau. We are giving the body its due. Physiology is overcoming theology. We are less hungry for lies. We are facing squarely some of the ugliness of life. Prostitution, for example. We speak less of duty and principles. We are not so enamoured of bourgeois conventions. We are less ashamed of our instincts. We no longer believe in a right which proceeds from a power that is unable to uphold it. There is an advance towards naturalness. In all political questions, even in the relations between parties, even in merchants' workmen's circles, only questions of power come into play. What one can do is the first question. What one ought to do is a secondary consideration. There is a certain degree of liberal-mindedness regarding morality, where this is most distinctly wanting, we regard its absence as a sign of a morbid condition, Carlyle, Ibsen, Schopenhauer. If there is anything which can reconcile us to our age, it is precisely the amount of immorality which it allows itself without falling in its own estimation. Modern science, despite its narrowing specialization, is a sign of assent. Here is strictness in service inexorability in small matters, as well as great, rapidity in weighing, judging, and condemning. The hardest is demanded here, the best is done without reward of praise or distinction. It is rather as among soldiers, almost nothing but blame and sharp reprimand is heard, for doing well prevails here as the rule, and the rule has, as everywhere, a silent tongue. It is the same with this severity of science, as with the manners and politeness of the best society. It frightens the uninitiated. He, however, who is accustomed to it, does not like to live anywhere but in this clear, transparent, powerful and highly electrified atmosphere. 
this manly atmosphere. In this achievement of science lies such an opportunity as philosophy has never had before. Science traces the course of things, but points to no goal. What it does give consists of the fundamental facts upon which the new goal must be based. All the sciences have now to pave the way for the future task of the philosopher, this task being understood to mean that he must solve the problem of value, that he has to fix the hierarchy of values. He must become lawgiver, commander. He must determine the whither and why for mankind. All knowledge must be at his disposal and must serve him as a tool for creation. Most certain of the signs of a reascending movement of life is the development of militarism. The military development of Europe is a delightful surprise. This fine discipline is teaching us to do our duty without expecting praise. Universal military service is the curious antidote which we possess for the effeminacy of democratic ideas. Men are learning again the joy of living in danger. Some of them are even learning the old truth that war is good in itself, aside from any gain in land or other wealth. Instead of saying, a good cause will hallow every war, they learn to say, a good war hallows every cause. When the instincts of a society ultimately make it give up war and conquest, it is decadent, it is ripe for democracy and the rule of shopkeepers. A state which should prevent war would not only be committing suicide, for war is just as necessary to the state as the slave is to society, it would be hostile to life, it would be an outrage on the future of man. The maintenance of the military state is the last means of adhering to the great traditions of the past, or where it has been lost, of reviving it. Only in this can the superior or strong type of man be preserved. A nation is a detour of nature to arrive at six or seven great men, and then to get around them. The state is the organization of immorality for the attainment of this purpose. But as existing today, the state is a very imperfect instrument, subject at any moment to democratic foundering. What concerns the thinker here is the slow and hesitant formation of a united Europe. This was the thought and the sole real work and impulse of the only broad-minded and deep-thinking men of this century, the tentative effort to anticipate the future of the European. Only in their weaker moments, or when they grew old, did they fall back again into the national narrowness of the fatherlanders. Then they were once more patriots. One thinks here of men like Napoleon, Heine, Goethe, Beethoven, Stendhal, Schopenhauer. And after all, is there a single idea behind this bovine nationalism? What possible value can there be in encouraging this arrogant self-conceit when everything today points to greater and more common interests? At a moment when the spiritual dependence and denationalization, which are obvious to all, are paving the way for the rapprochements and fertilizations which make up the real value and sense of present-day culture, what an instrument such a united Europe would be for the development and protection and expression of superior individuals. What a buoyant ascent of life after this long descent into democracy. See now, in review, the two movements which we have studied and on which we have strung our philosophy. On the one hand, Christian mythology and morality, the cult of weakness, the fear of life, the deterioration of the species, ever-increasing suppression of the privileged and the strong, the lapse into democracy, feminism, socialism, and at last into anarchy, all terminating in pessimism, despair, total loss of the love of life. On the other hand, the reaffirmation of the worth of life, the resolute distinction between slave morality and master morality, the recognition of the aristocratic valuation of health, vigour, energy, as moral in all their forms, and of the will to power as the source and significance of all action and all living, the conception of the higher man, of the exceptional individual, as the goal of human endeavour, the redirection of marriage, of education, of social structure, to the fostering and cherishing of these higher types, culminating in the supernational organization of Europe as the instrumentality and artistic expression of the superior man. Is this philosophy too hard to bear? 
very well, but those races that cannot bear it are doomed, and those which regard it as the greatest blessing are destined to be masters of the world. 14. Criticism. What shall one say to this? What would a Democrat say? such a democrat as would be a friend to socialism and feminism and even to anarchism and a lover of Jesus. One pictures such a man listening with irritated patience to the foregoing and responding very readily to an invitation to take the floor. There are lessons here, he begins, as if brushing away an initial encumbrance. There is something of Nietzsche in all of us, just as there is something of Jesus almost as there is something of man and of woman in all of us, as Weininger argued, and part of that crowd called myself is flattered by this doctrine of ruthless power. Nietzsche stood outside our social and moral structure. He was a sort of hermit in the world of thought, and so he could see things in that structure which are too near to our noses for easy vision. And as you listen to him, you see history anew as a long succession of masterings and enslavings and deceivings, and you become almost reconciled to the future being nothing but a further succession of the same. And then you begin to see that if the future is to be different, one of the things we must do is to pinch ourselves out of this Nietzschean dream. And a good way to begin is with Nietzsche's own principle, that every philosophy is a physiology. He asks us to believe that there is no such thing as a morbid trait in him, but we must not take him at his word. The most important point about this philosophy is that it was written by a sick man, a man sick to the very roots, if you will let me say it, abnormal in sexual constitution, a man not sufficiently attracted to the other sex, because he has so much of the other sex in him. She is a woman, he writes in Zarathustra and never loves anyone but a warrior. That is, if Nietzsche but knew it, the diagnosis of his own disease. This hatred of women, this longing for power, this admiration for strength, for successful lying, this inability to see a tertium quid between tyranny and slavery, all these are feminine traits. A stronger man would not have been so shrewishly shrill about woman and Christianity, a stronger man would have needed less repetition, less emphasis and underlining, less of italics and exclamation points. A stronger man would have been more gentle and would have smiled where Nietzsche scolds. It is the philosophy, you see, of a man abnormally weak in the social instincts and at the same time lacking in proper outlet for such social instincts as nature has left him. Consequently, he never gets beyond the individual. He thinks society is made up of individuals when it is really made up of groups. He supposes that the only virtues a man can have are those which help him as an isolated unit. The idea that a man may find self-expression in social expression, in cooperation, that there are virtues which are virtues because they enable one to work with others against a common evil, this notion never occurs to him. He does not see that sympathy and mutual aid, for example, though they preserve some inferior individuals, yet secure that group solidarity, and therefore group survival, without which even the strong ones would perish. He does not imagine that perhaps the barbarians who invaded Rome needed the gospel of a gentle Jesus, meek and mild, if anything at all was to remain of that same classical culture which he paints so lovingly. He laughs at self-denial, and then invites you to devote yourself forever to some self-elected superman. This philosophy of aristocracy, of the necessity of slavery, of the absurdity of democracy, of course it is exciting to all weak people who would like to have power, and who have not read it all before in Plato. In this particular case, the humour of the situation lies in the very powerful attack which Nietzsche makes on the irreligious religious humbug which has proved one of the chief instruments of mastery in the hands of the class whose power he is trying to strengthen. I hope to be forgiven, says Nietzsche, for discovering that all moral philosophy hitherto has belonged to the soporific appliances. Discovering, as if the aristocracy had not known that all along. Here is a naive bookworm, these strong men will say among themselves, who has discovered what every one of us knows. He presumes to tell us how to increase our power, and he can find no better way of helping us than to expose in print the best secrets of our trade. 
Just in this lies the value of Nietzsche, as Rousseau said of Machiavelli. He lets us in behind the scenes of the drama of exploitation. We know better now the men with whom democracy must deal. We see the greed for power that hides behind the contention that culture cannot exist without slavery. Grant that contention. So much the worse for culture. If culture means the increasing concentration of the satisfactions of life in the hands of a few superior pigs, their culture may be dispensed with. If it is to stay, it will have to mean the direction of knowledge and ability to the spread of the satisfactions of life. Which is finer, the relationship of master and slave, or that of friend and friend? Surely a world of people liking and helping one another is a finer world to live in than one in which the instincts of aggression are supreme. And such a cooperative civilization need not fear the tests of survival. Selection puts an ever higher premium on solidarity, an ever lower value on pugnacity. Intelligence, not ready anger, will win the great contests of the future. Friendship will pay. The history of the world is a record of the patient and planful attempt to replace hatred by understanding, narrowness by large vision, opposition by cooperation, slavery by friendship. Friendship, a word to be avoided by those who would appear blasé. But let us repeat it. Words have been known to nourish deeds which without them might never have grown into reality. Some find heaven in making as many men as possible their slaves. Others find heaven in making as many men as possible their friends. Which type of man will we have? Which type of man, if abundant, would make this world a splendor and a delight? The hope for which Jesus lived was that man might someday come to mean friend. It is the only hope worth living for. 15. Nietzsche replies. It is certainly not the least charm of a theory, says Nietzsche, that it is refutable. But what have I to do with mere refutations? A prelude I am of better players. Verily, I counsel you, said Zarathustra, depart from me and defend yourselves against Zarathustra, and better still, be ashamed of him. Perhaps he hath deceived you. The man of perception must not only be able to love his enemies, but also to hate his friends. One ill requiteth one's teacher by always remaining only his scholar. Why will ye not pluck at my wreath? Ye revere me. But how if your reverence one day falleth down? Beware of being crushed to death with a statue. Ye say ye believe in Zarathustra, but what is Zarathustra worth? Ye are my faithful ones, but what are all faithful ones worth? When ye had not yet sought yourselves, ye found me. Thus do all faithful ones. Hence, all belief is worth so little. Now I ask you to lose me and find yourselves. Not until all of you have disowned me shall I return unto you. 16. Conclusion Look, says Rudin in Turgenev's story, you see that apple tree. It has broken down with the weight and multitude of its own fruit. It is the emblem of genius. To perish beneath a load one can neither bear nor throw off, wrote Nietzsche. That is a philosopher. I shall announce the song of the lightning said Zarathustra, and perish in the announcing. Insanity with such a man is but a matter of time. He feels it coming upon him. He values his hours like a man condemned to execution. In twenty days he writes The Genealogy of Morals. In one year, 1888, he produces The Twilight of the Idols, Antichrist, The Case of Wagner, Exe Homo, and his longest and greatest book, The Will to Power. He not only writes these books, he reads the proof sheets, straining his eyes beyond repair. He is almost blind now. He is deceived, taken advantage of, because he can hardly see farther than his touch. If I were blind, he writes pitifully, I should be healthy. Yet his body is racked with pain. On 118, days this year I have had severe attacks. I have given a name to my pain and call it a dog, it is just as pitiful, just as importunate and shameless, and I can domineer over it, vent my bad humour on it, as others do with their dogs, servants and wives. Meanwhile, the world lives on unnoticing, or noticing only to misunderstand. 
My foes have become mighty and have so distorted my teaching that my best beloved must be ashamed of the gifts that I gave them. He learns that the libertines of Europe are using his philosophy as a cloak for their sins. I can read in their faces that they totally misunderstand me and that it is only the animal in them which rejoices at being able to cast off its fetters. He finds one whom he thinks to make his disciple. He is buoyed up for a few days by the hope. The hope is shattered and loneliness closes in once more upon him. A kingdom for a kind word, he cries out in the depth of his longing. And again he writes, For years no milk of human kindness, no breath of love. In December 1888, one whom he has thought friendly writes that his brother-in-law is sending to a magazine an attack on him. It is the last blow. It means that his sister has joined the others in deserting him. I take one sleeping draught after another to deaden the pain, but for all that I cannot sleep. Today I will take such a dose that I will lose my wits. He has been taking chloral and worse drugs to pay for the boon of sleep. The poison tips the scale already made heavy by his blindness and eye strain, by his loneliness, by the treachery of his friends, by his general bodily ailments. He wakes up from this final draught in a stupor from which he never recovers. He writes to Brandes and signs himself the Crucified. He wanders into the street, is tormented by children, falls in a fit. His good landlord helps him back to his room, sends for the simple, ignorant doctor of the neighborhood. But it is too late. The man is insane. Age, 44. Another, the only name greater than his among modern philosophers, had died at that pitifully early age. The body lingered eleven years behind the mind. Death came in 1900. He was buried as he had wished. Promise me. He had asked his sister many years before that when I die only my friends shall stand about my coffin and no inquisitive crowd. See that no priest or anyone else utters falsehoods at my graveside when I can no longer defend myself and let me descend into my tomb as an honest pagan. After his death the world began to read him. As in so many cases the life had to be given that the doctrine might be heard. Only where there are graves, he had written in Zarathustra, are there resurrections.